be a part of the meeting as always. If you would get your Bible open up to Romans chapter 8 to start with, Romans chapter 8. Appreciate Grace School of Bible and Richard inviting me and the, uh, the word of encouragement there is also, uh, am I supposed to start this thing? This, this you won't appreciate. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I added you a minute. So come back All right. So we appreciate being asked to be a part of the conference. It's always an honor to be here. Uh, a couple things as you find the passage. Just want to announce we're having a, a conference in October, October uh, 23rd, 24th, and 25th in Michigan. And the topic this year is what in the world is going on, grace in our culture. And the speakers this year are going to be myself, Matt Hawley, and uh, Brother John Verstegen is going to be there from uh, California. So we appreciate that. Also, just very quickly, we have information table. The brochures for the conference are on the information table back out here, as well as some literature that has been produced by our ministry. And Brother Jordan said some things yesterday about J.C. O'Hare. If you're interested in the history of the Grace Movement, uh, see me about the Grace History Project, which uh, is, a, is a five-year study that I did on church history, starting with Paul and coming all the way through where we are today. I know some of you are familiar with that. If you want to know more about that, let me know, and I can give you the details on how to do that. But beyond that, I want to get right going right away. i got a lot to say, and as everybody has, and as always, never enough time to say everything that you want to. So the topic I've been given on to speak on this morning is the issue of inheritance, and specifically, this is my assignment. It says, a study of the body of Christ as God's inheritance and how our life in time impacts our status in the ages to come. And the passages I've been given are Romans 8, Ephesians 1, and Colossians chapter 3. So as you think about the structure of what I want to cover with you this morning, I'm basically going to take those three passages. We're going to look at Romans 8 first, and we, I want to just establish some basic things about our inheritance. Then we'll go to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll talk about how we're His inheritance. And then we'll end in Colossians chapter 3, talking about how the, how the way we live our lives here today on earth as members of the church, the body of Christ, impacts into eternity. So we're going to kind of look at those three, th three things and just sort of take them in order here. So to, to get started, if you would, go to uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And of course, it's already been mentioned at least once this morning that this is a verse that has been, uh, become somewhat controversial. And I'm just going to teach this verse the way I understand it, okay? And the way that I think you should understand it too uh, out, of, out of your King James Bible. If you look at Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8, yeah, verse 17, it says, And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity that we have to study your word. We pray that the saints would be edified and that you would be glorified. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So the first thing I want, to, I want you to see, and by the way, these notes are all on my website. Don't even try to write them all down because you're never going to keep up with me, okay? And, but uh, all, all the notes that I have in front of me are also on the website. The first thing I want you to see about that verse is that this verse is comprised of two separate conditional statements with some exposition and some extra descriptive material sandwiched in between. Look at verse 17. It says, and if children, then heirs, semicolon, okay? Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, semicolon, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So you see that structurally, and I have this up here on the screen, you have the first conditional statement. It says, and if children, then what? Heirs, okay? In between that, you have further exposition about what kind of heir you are, okay? You're an heir of God and a joint heir with who? Christ, semicolon, then you have another conditional statement where it says, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be what? glorified together. So I just want you to see structurally how the verse is set up. Now, it is my opinion that if you're going to understand that verse properly, you need to understand some things about the conditions and how conditions work. And it's almost lunchtime, and I'm about ready to... I'm not going to be serving you today a Greek salad. I'm going to be serving you an English muffin, okay? And hopefully the English muffin will have a little bit of butter and jam on it so it won't be bland and boring and you'll be able to understand what we're going on, what's going on here. But there's some technical things about conditions that I want to go over with you because they're essential to understanding what's going on, not only in this verse with these two conditional statements, but also all throughout Paul's epistles. If you don't understand the conditional statements properly, you're going to make shipwreck of what's going on, okay? So if, as you think about this, just look at that statement. So we're looking at the beginning of the verse. And if children, then heirs. That statement is in the form of 
if some such thing, then some such thing. Okay? So in other words, if A, then what? B. That's basic logic. Okay? That's, that's a basic logical structure. Okay? I got in my notes all kinds of complicated stuff about that, but I'm going to skip it. But it, it, it's in the basic form of a logical structure. If A, then B. So look at verse 17. And if children, then what? Now, the issue is how do you understand that condition, right? Is Paul saying maybe you're a child and maybe you're not? Or if he's saying if it's true that you're a child, then you're what? You're an heir. How do you know that? Look at verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we might be the children of God. That we what? That we are the children of God. So does verse 16 state emphatically that as a member of the church, the body of Christ, you're a child of God, okay? Now, that's by virtue of your justification and your position in the Lord Jesus Christ and all the things that have been said already uh, throughout the week. So if it's true that you're, a chi- that you're a child, then is it also true that you're an heir? Yes. yes. So when he says there in verse 17, and if children then heirs, does he mean maybe you're an heir, maybe you're not? Or, if he me- or is he saying on the basis of the established fact that you're a child, then you're also what? In air. Now, I want to just say a few more things about that before we move on. And please bear with me. So what I want to answer then is what is the function then of this first if in verse 17? Well, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, okay, and you look up the word if in the Oxford English Dictionary, this is what the dictionary tells you the word if means in English. It means introducing a clause of condition or supposition, the protasis of a conditional sentence, on condition that, given or granted that, in the case that, supposing that, or on the supposition that, okay? So that is the basic definition of if. If you look at the verse, the verse is structured as you would expect it to be structured as a conditional statement. And if children, that's the if statement. That's what we would call in, in logic the protasis or grammar the protasis. That's, that's the condition. And then you have the consequent or the result if Children, then what? Heirs, okay? So this is what the basic definition of if means in English. Now, what's interesting is that all conditional statements have two parts, okay? They have a protasis and they have, Charlie's going to laugh at me, they have an apotis. You can just say hippopotamus if you want, okay? If that's going to help you remember that better, okay? But the protasis of that statement is, and if children, what's the consequent? Then heirs. So if it's true that you're a child of God, is it true you're an heir of God? Yes, okay? So when the dictionary also tells you that when you have the indicative mood in English after if, that means something significant. Let me explain this to you. This is the dictionary definition, Oxford English Dictionary. It says, the indicative after if implies that the speaker expresses no adverse opinion as to the, as to the statement in the clause and it is consistent with his acceptance of it. In other words, if, and it's what? True. If I look up the English word indicative, the definition of the English word indicative basically means, and it's up here on the screen, of a form of statement having the verb in the indicative mood assertive of an objective fact. Okay? So Paul does Paul establish the fact in verse 16 that we're children of God? What's he doing in verse 17? He's taking the established fact that you're a child of God and he's now elaborating on it by presenting to you a logical argument. He's saying, if you're a child and you are, right, then you're also what? An heir, okay? Now, why this is important is because if you have the subjunctive mood after if, again, Oxford English Dictionary says, the subjunctive after if implies that the speaker guards himself from endorsing the truth or realization of the statement. It is consistent with his doubt of it, okay? Subjunctive means dependent, subjoined or dependent, designating a mood, the form of which, sorry, the forms of which are employed to denote an action or a state as conceived and not as what? Fact, okay? So let's let's look at some examples of this with me, if you would. Come with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Come with me, look at Colossians chapter 3. Verse 
Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, if, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now, is he saying, maybe you're risen with Christ, maybe you're not? Or is he saying, if you are risen with Christ, and you are, then seek those things which are where? Above. So what you understand is in English, can you have, the, can you have conditions that function differently depending on how the conditional statement is structured? How do I know that Colossians 3, chapter 1 is in the form of if and it's true? We'll go to chapter 2 and look at verse, uh, look at verse 13. It says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. Actually, I want a verse 12. That's a typo. Verse 12, buried with him by baptism, where, now watch, wherein also ye are what? Risen with him. Does Paul state as as an objective positional fact and truth of your spiritual life in Christ that you are risen with Christ? So then when you come to chapter 3, verse 1, he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, is he now all of a sudden saying, maybe you're risen, maybe you're not? Or is he going to say... On the basis of the fact that you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are where? Above. Okay? Let's look at a, a different example. Come to Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Look at verse 2. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. <coughs> he says here, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he what? Liveth. Now watch the next part of the verse. But if if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Now, is that an indicative statement of fact or is that a condition in the form of maybe it is, maybe it isn't? Okay, so in other words, as long as the wife's husband is alive, is she is she bound to the law of her husband? Yes. But if the husband's dead, is she loose from the law of the husband? So the satisfaction of the condition if is contingent on the situation and the circumstances. As long as the husband is alive, the wife is bound unto who? The husband. If the husband's dead, if the husband is in the, the state of being deceased, the wife is now loosed from what? The law of her husband. So come back with me now to, to Romans chapter 8. So the question then is, which type of condition are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with the type of condition in Romans eight seventeen of if and it's true, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't? Look at, look at the verse. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs. So if you are a child of God, then are you an heir of God? Is that absolutely true? For every single person, that's a child of God. Okay? So in that format, in that structure there, grammatically, Paul's not saying, geez, I'm not sure if you're children. I'm not sure if you're children or not. He's saying, on the basis of the established fact that you are children, then you're also what? If some such thing, then what? Some such thing. Now, all that being said, just a, a hint for you. Try to simplify this. So when you're dealing with a conditional statement, you need to always ask yourself the following, which type of condition am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a condition of if, and it's true, or if, maybe it is, maybe it what? Maybe it isn't. Now, you understand that if I say to my kids, if I say to my son, if you're my son, then act like it. Am I saying, well, geez, I'm really not sure if you're my son? (laughs) Am I questioning whether or not he's my son? Or am I saying, on the basis of the established fact that you're my son, you need to what? You need to act like it. Okay, so look at Romans 8, 17. So let's move on. And if children, then heirs, semicolon. So is it true that every, every child of God is an heir? Okay. So the next question you need to ask yourself then is, well, what kind of heir are you? Semicolon, and the information next is going to tell you what kind of heir you are. You are, as it says in the verse, heirs of God, comma, and joint heirs with who? Joint heirs with Christ. So the issue of the... Now, if you just take a natural reading, if you just look at that statement there after the first semicolon, and you just, and you just read it naturally, and it says, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, is there anything there that would tell you to think that there's a difference between being an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ? Comma, and. See, the word and. The word and 
means the word and can be continuative or it can be contrastive depending on the context in which it's used, right? Flip over to Romans chapter 9, look at verse 21. Verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay? Now watch, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto what? Now in Romans 9, 21 is the word and contrasting the two different vessels. Yeah, is that clear when you just read it in English, right? Now when you go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, in this verse... The word and is not establishing a contrast between heirs and joint heirs. It's establishing a continuance. In other words, if you're a child of God, are you an heir? If you're an heir, what kind of heir are you? You're an heir of God and a joint heir with who? With Christ, semicolon. Okay, now, folks, it, it just, when Paul speaks about the inheritance, he speaks about us having one inheritance. Come to Romans chapter, I'm sorry, come to Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. The believer's inheritance in Paul's epistles and and, and Pauline theology is described as being singular. Ephesians chapter 1. These two verses are two of the text verses I was given, so I'm going to cover them here in this section. Verse 11. In whom we also have obtained two inheritances. What's it say? And what? And by the way, have you already obtained it? It's what it says, right? It's past tense. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Look at verse 14. It says, which is the earnest of our what? Inheritance. The Holy Spirit is the earnest down payment of your inheritance, right? So if you are a child of God, are you an heir? You're an heir. The Holy Spirit has been given to you as, as, as a down payment, Um, as the earnest deposit, if you will, on that inheritance, sealing you under the day of redemption in this passage. And when Paul speaks about the inheritance, he speaks about it in the singular, not in the what? Not in the plural. Now, I want to look at a few more things. Come over to Titus. Come over to Titus chapter 3. Come over to Titus chapter 3. Now, I don't mean to desecrate the podium here but i'm taking my jacket off okay because i'm hot and i'm sweaty and i'm taking it off so if that offends you i'll beg your forgiveness before the judgment seat of christ okay (laughs) titus chapter three titus chapter three look with me at verse five not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the holy ghost which he has shed abundantly through jesus christ our savior now watch verse seven that being justified how We've had a lot of preaching already this week about that issue, right? That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of what? How were you made an heir? You were made an heir because you were justified freely by His what? Grace. And one of the things that you get as part of the package of redemption and part of the package of justification is you get an inheritance. Why? Because as as Rodney was talking about, you're taken out of the kingdom of darkness and you're placed into the kingdom of his dear son. And now you're in the family. And as a child of the family, do you receive an inheritance? Yeah. A lot of things to say here. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Now, do we, do we get this inheritance because we're such, you know, great, wonderful people? So deserving of the inheritance? Colossians chapter 1. Look with me at verse 12. <clears throat> Giving thanks unto the Father who, sorry, far, sorry, which hath made us. To be made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Who made you meet to be a partaker of the inheritance? The Father did. How did the Father make you meet? The Father made you meet by joining you with who? Christ. Okay, get get two passages with me. Get First Timothy in one and Galatians four in the other. Get First Timothy chapter one and Galatians chapter four in the other. Okay, First Timothy. And Galatians 4. And then I want you to look at the screen if you would. Man in his natural state, right? 
If you are, when you are born, you are born dead in trespasses and sins, are you not? You are dead in sin, you are in Adam, right? If you die in this situation illustrated here on the board, what are you an heir of? You are an heir of eternal punishment, right? If you, are, if you die having your sins separate you from God, you die in heir of eternal punishment, right? So the question then is, how do you become an heir of God? How do, you, how do you get from that situation over there with sin separating between you and God to become an heir of God? I think we would all agree, right, that in that situation illustrated there on the board, is anybody an heir of God? Yes. Nope. You are an heir of the wrath of God, are you not? So how do you get from there to there? You get there by receiving the finished work of who? The, you get there by receiving the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 5, <laughs> it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man who? So in other words, if I'm, if I'm over here and I'm dead in trespasses and sins and I'm an heir of eternal punishment on the previous slide, how do I become an heir of God? I become an heir of God by passing through the atoning work of the one mediator between God and what? Man. Can I be an heir of God without being joined to the Lord Jesus Christ? No. It is absolutely makes no sense at all to say that you can be an heir of God and not also at the same time be a joint heir with Christ. It is illogical, and more importantly, it is unscriptural. Come with me to Galatians chapter 4. <coughs> Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but what? A son. And if a son, there, there, there it is. Is he saying, maybe you're a son, maybe you're not? No, he's saying, if and you are. If and you are. And if a son, then heir of God, period. How do you become an heir of God? Through who? Christ. Through Christ. Can I be an heir of God without being joined to the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Go back, to, go back with me to Romans chapter 8. So when it says in this verse, if you just break the verse down and look at it, it says, and if children then heirs, semicolon, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ... The heirs of God join heirs with Christ portion of that verse is giving you further elaboration and information on what kind of heir you are. You are an heir of God, and by virtue, and you can't become an heir of God without being joined to who? So let me show this to you, okay? It's impossible and illogical for one to be an heir of God and not at the same time be a joint heir with Christ. Number one, all believers are heirs of God who inherit all things. Look at Romans 8, 32. Look at, look at, look at verse 32. He that, spared not his, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us what? All things. So are you an heir of God that inherits all things? Okay, come with me to Hebrews. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 1. This pulpit's small. I got this wide margin Schofield Bible here, and it's like, I wish I would have known that. I would have brought a smaller Bible. Hebrews chapter 1. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who has sundry times in a diverse manner, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Look at verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Who's his Son? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who, uh, notice, whom he hath appointed heir of how many things? Yes. Folks, is Jesus Christ an heir of God who inherits all things? Are you an heir of God who inherits all things? How can you not be a joint heir with Christ? Because what's true of him is true of who? It's true of us. Okay? So therefore, all believers must be joint heirs with Christ because both Christ and you and I are heirs of God that inherit what? All things. Okay? It can't be any other way go back to romans chapter 8 now i well i'll wait to say that go, go back to romans chapter 8 
Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, semicolon. If so be. Folks, the semicolon sets the next statement apart from the, next, from the previous. If somebody is going to try to tell you that the punctuation there makes no difference whatsoever to how you understand that verse, you need to not listen to them. Okay? Just look at the verse. And if children and heirs, semicolon, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, providing further elaboration on what kind of an heir you are, semicolon, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Okay? Now, I understand things that are being said, and it's, I'm not going to address those things. I'm just going to teach the verse the way that I understand the verse and have come to understand the verse through, through study and so forth. But what you need to understand, if you look at that statement, if you look at the second half of the verse, the if so be, guess what you have? You have another conditional statement in the form of if some such thing, then what? Some such thing. Look at what it says. If so be that we suffer with him, comma, that we may also be what? Glorified together. So again, you have to ask yourself, what kind of condition is this? Is this a condition in the form of if and it's true? Or is this a condition in the form of maybe it is, maybe it isn't? Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about that just for a minute. Um, if you think about that, um, and I broke it down here for you again so that you can uh, see, just trying to keep it simple. Come with me if you would to Matthew chapter, come with me if you would to Matthew chapter 18. Even this phrase, you need to be watchful of somebody that would tell you that the phrase, if so be, means the same thing every time it occurs. Okay. Frankly, you need to be watchful of anybody that's going to tell you everything is always the same way. Because as soon as they tell you everything is always the same way, there's always going to be what? One, some exception, okay? So it, it, it's, it's, not good, it's not good Bible study and it's not helpful to make a pronunciation that if so be means the same thing every time you see that phrase occur, okay? And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. It says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which has gone astray? What's the answer? Yeah. Look at verse 13. And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of, the sheep, uh, of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Let me ask you a question. When is the son of when is he going to rejoice? He's only going to rejoice if he finds what? The sheep. If he doesn't find the sheep, is he going to rejoice? No. So is it contingent on the circumstances? Okay? So here is a form of the condition again that is not, it's not if and it's true there. It's maybe it is, maybe it what? Maybe it isn't. If he finds the sheep, he'll rejoice. If he doesn't find the sheep, he what? He won't. Come to Ephesians chapter 4. Hopefully you're enjoying your English muffin. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> Somebody, Desby, bring me that water, please. Oh, thank you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. Now, look, look what it says here. But ye have not so learned. Is learned there past, present, or future tense? It's past tense. He says, but ye have not so learned Christ. Thank you. Verse 21. If so be that ye have been taught by him. I'm sorry. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, what is Paul saying here? Is he saying, maybe I taught you this and maybe I didn't? If he's, is he saying, maybe I taught you these things, maybe I didn't? No, he's not saying that. How do you know he's not saying that? Look at what the verse says, verse 21. If so be that ye have heard. Is that past or future tense? That's past tense. So has he, have they already heard? Yeah. Then he goes on and he says, if so be that, that ye have heard him and have, and have been taught by him. Is that past tense? So, in other words, Paul is not here saying, maybe I taught you this stuff, maybe I didn't. But he's saying, on the basis of the established fact that I taught you this, here's how you should what? Live. 
You understand the difference? Okay. Now, that t- you need to understand that to get a hold of what's going on. Go back with me to Romans chapter 8. Go back with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 17. So is Paul saying here in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, is he saying this? Is he saying, well, maybe we're joint heirs and maybe we're not. We just have to wait and see how it turns out in the end. Is that what he's saying? No. He's saying on the basis of the established fact that you're a child of God, you're an heir. And what kind of heir are you? You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ because you can't be an heir of God without also being a joint heir with who? Christ. Because it's your identification with Christ, as Rodney was just talking about, that made you an heir of God in the first place. So when you get to the statement here, if so be that we suffer, this isn't calling into question whether or not you're a joint heir. It's making a further statement of factual truth. Do you suffer with him? Romans chapter 6, Rodney just read it. Look at verse 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by by, by baptism into what? Is Paul saying maybe you suffer with Christ, maybe you don't? Now go back to to Romans 8, 17. Folks, if that's what he's saying... If, you, if, if, you, if that's what he's saying, look at the verse. If so be that we suffer with him. If he's, saying, if he's not saying on the basis of the established fact that we suffer with him, that we may also be what? Glorified together. If you don't understand the first part of that as a statement of fact, you know what you're doing? You're calling into question whether or not you'll be glorified. It has to be that way because that's the way the grammatical structure of the verse works. Everybody following that? If some such thing, then what? Some such thing. If we suffer with him and we do, then we will also be what? Glorified together with him. Go to, go to verse, uh, you're in Romans 8, flip over. Man, I'm way off where I wanted to be, but look at verse 29. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among some brethren. Among what? Many. Are you one of the many? If you trusted Christ, you are, aren't you? Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also what? Folks, if you, under, if you read that and you understand that to be a statement of hypothetical condition in the sense of, Maybe we suffer, maybe we don't. What you're doing is you're throwing doubt and calling into question whether or not you're going to be glorified with him. And that is not what that verse is designed to do. That verse is designed to give you confidence and knowing of who you are in Christ, knowing what you're going to face living in this life in a world that is still cursed by sin. That is the context of Romans chapter 8. Now, I've spent way too much time on that. Come with me to Ephesians 1. So we've we've established some things about our inheritance. Now we want to move on to a second consideration. The second consideration that we're moving on to is predicated on the fact that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And that is the fact that God is going to use us and inherit some things through us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse... I want verse 18... We've already read verse 11, talking about obtaining an inheritance. We've already read verse 14, talking about our inheritance. And just just, just look at that just quickly. Verse 11, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Whose inheritance is that? That's ours. Look at verse 14, which is the earnest of whose inheritance? Our inheritance. Now contrast that, if you would, with verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his what? His inheritance where? Do you understand that that verse is saying that God the Father is going to inherit something through you and I, His saints, as members of the church, the body of Christ? Okay? Well, what is He going to inherit? What what does God the Father stand to inherit via you and I, the members of His body? Read on. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power, verse 19, to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, verse 21, far above what? All principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. 
not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, that's Christ's feet, and gave him to be head over all things to who? Who's the church? That's you and I. The church is comprised of his what? His body, his saints, right? All those that have trusted in Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says that God is going to inherit something through who? In the context, through us, right? What's he going to inherit through us in the context? Verse 21, principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is what? Name. You understand that the reason, the reason God the Father formed the church, the body of Christ to begin with, was so that he could create an agency that he could use to repossess the governmental structures of heaven and earth. Okay? And in forming that body, he's forming the very agency that he's going to use out there in, the, in eternity future to repossess the heavenly places back to himself. So not only do you have an inheritance, but he is going to inherit these governmental structures through the instrumentality of us as members of the church, the body of Christ. So not only do we have our inheritance earlier on in the chapter, we also see that he has an inheritance in and through who? Us. Now, folks, I'm just going to say it this way, and I'm not gonna, I don't want to uh, uh, trample on Morris's message tomorrow about raining, but I'm going to say it this way. How can you be a member of the body of Christ the agency that he created to repossess the governmental structures back into himself and not reign with Christ. Why did, he, why did he save you? Why did he give you an inheritance in the first place so that he could use you to accomplish something for who? Himself. Now, we understand that in eternity are there going to be uh, different levels of responsibility. I'll say it that way. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. But look, I want to point something out here about verse 21. Verse 20 talks about exalted far above his right hand in heavenly places and so forth. Verse 21, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is what? First of all, I want you to notice, is the every name that is named included in the list? So one of the things that's commonly said, well, I want to go straight from my notes here so I don't mess this up. So before you write off the expression, every name that is named is sort of a throwaway expression referring only to those who are heirs of God because they don't qualify for joint heirship and reigning, I want you to note the following points. What governmental position is not listed in Ephesians chapter 1? I'm not, we're not going to go there. Go look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, but thrones, right? Are thrones a position of authority in the government of heaven? Are they not listed in that passage here in Ephesians chapter 1? So are we saying then, if, if, are you saying then based upon the context of Ephesians chapter 1 that in every name that is named does not include a throne? It obviously what? Seems to me that it would have to, right? Why do I think that? Well, if you look, the second thing I want you to consider is if you look up the English definition of the word name. Now, if you try to cross-reference every name that is named, there's not much to go by. It's the only time this expression occurs, and it's, it's, hard, it's a little fuzzy, right? If you look up the English word name in the Webster's 1820 Dictionary, I think it's the seventh or eighth definition. You know what it says? It means authority. It means behalf, part. As in the name of the people, when a man speaks or acts in the nature of another, in the name of another, excuse me, he does this by their authority or in their behalf as their representative. Folks, in every name that is named is not talking about the janitorial staff of eternity. It's just an expression to describe any other position of authority that's what? That's out there. Let me ask you a question. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians. Do you already have a governmental position now? What are you? You're an ambassador. Did God save you by His grace and leave you here as a, as a, a diplomatic ambassador of His kingdom? So are you telling me that he's going to save you by his grace, he's going to make you his ambassador now, here in this life, and then when you get out there into eternity, he's going to say, all of a sudden, you don't measure up, you don't get to do this, that, or the other thing. Amen. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, we are what? What is an ambassador? An ambassador is somebody that represents somebody in their name. And every name that is named is talking about any other position of representative governmental authority that is out there. He's going, to re-get, he's going to reclaim all of that stuff back to himself through who? Through us. Now, just because, come with me to Colossians. Man, I'm cutting stuff out of here. Just because all believers will reign. Look, folks, this thing about the conditions. Think about uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall, we shall also what? Is he saying, eh, maybe you suffer, maybe you don't. If he's saying that, then he's saying that not everybody's going to what? But if he's saying, if you suffer, oh, and by the way, you what? You do, and you are, you're also going to what? Rain. So the stuff about the conditions that we went over earlier is completely pertinent to this whole discussion that we're having here go to colossians chapter 3 colossians chapter 3 that's not to say that how you and i live and function today here in on earth has no bearing on what your responsibility is going to be in eternity okay so let me be clear about two things number one you can't be a member of the body of christ and be part of his inheritance in the saints and not be involved in the governmental authority in the heavenly places. It's imp- it's not that's that's not what he saved you for. But we need to be understanding that whatever your specific responsibility in eternity is going to be is going to be based on the service capacity for the Lord Jesus Christ that you build up where here. Okay. Colossians chapter three, verse. Well, you know what? Just just look at the context here. Um, in verse 5, he says, mortify, therefore, your members, which are where? <laughs> so he, there, so he's, is he, he's talking about how you live where? Here, right? Uh, verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. So we don't have time to do it, but he, he says, here's what you need to mortify. Here's what you need to put to death. Here's what you need to put off. Here's what you need to what? Put on, right? And then you come down through and he says, um, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives. Verse 20, children, obey your parents. Verse 21, fathers, provoke now your children to anger. Verse 22, servants, obey in all things, obey in all things your masters. What's he talking about in this context? He's talking about you serving God through your domestic responsibilities. That's what he's talking about. Husband, wife, parent, child, servant, master, all that stuff, right? That's what he's talking about in the context. And then you get to verse 23 and it says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to who? The Lord and not unto who? I have a question. Verse 23, who's the ye? Specifically, in the context, the ye is the believers where? In Colossae. By extension, it applies to who? Us, right? Okay. But he says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto who? Why? Read the next verse. Knowing, verse 24, knowing that of the Lord you might possibly one day receive the reward of the inheritance if you qualify. So why, why do you do all things heartily under the Lord in verse 23? Because you know that you will, you shall receive the reward of what? Folks, if you, let's say for the sake of argument and discussion, that I wanted to say that the reward of the inheritance there is the additional reward of being made a joint heir with Christ. I don't believe that. I'm just saying for the sake of argument and discussion. Okay, Kenny? <laughs> so... But let's say that's what it is. Read the verse. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. 
If the reward of the inheritance is being a joint heir with Christ, then isn't everybody a joint heir with Christ anyway? Because everybody receives what? Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Notice that it does not say that the inheritance is the reward. It says the reward of what? So the reward is out of what? The inheritance. Is the reward and the inheritance two different things? The reward, so you, is your inheritance open for discussion? Is your reward yet undetermined? Your reward is something that, is, that you are in the process right now of what? Of, of you know, determining what that's going to be. Do you understand? Well, I don't have time to do this, but you understand that if you look up the word inheritance in the dictionary and you look up the word reward in the dictionary, they don't mean the same thing? They don't. What's the definition of, let me read you the definition of reward. Reward to, now, because now, some of you, I know what you're saying. Wait, 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 wait a minute. How is it that everybody gets the reward of the inheritance? You need to let go of your conditioning when you think about the word reward. Okay, let me read you the definition. Definite, where to go? To give in return either good or evil. Hence, when good is returned for good, reward signifies to repay, to recompense, to compensate. When evil or suffering is returned for injury or wickedness, reward signifies to punish with just retribution, to take vengeance on according to the nature of the case, right? So what I want you to see here is that if you think about the word reward, the word reward has a positive meaning and outcome, but the word reward also has a negative positive meaning and what? Outcome, okay? Now, if you think about reward, the, the, the first definition of reward means to give in return either good or evil. Look at verse 24. But he that doeth wrong, or verse 25, sorry. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the what? The wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of what? Persons. If you receive, can you receive a negative reward? Yes. Can you receive a positive reward? Are rewards given in Paul's in the Pauline Scripture for both? Po Doesn't Paul say reward Alexander the coppersmith according to his work? Is that a positive reward? <laughs> no. Come over to Ephesians chapter six. Hold your hand there. Come over to Ephesians chapter six. And I gotta move quick here. Look at Ephesians chapter six, verse eight. He's talking here about servants being obedient to their masters and so forth. He says in verse 6, Not with thy service as men pleaders, but as the servants of God doing the will of God from where? The heart. That's not the verse I wanted. I wanted the verse where it talks about him be, them being rewarded. But you understand there's a difference between these two things, right? What? Somebody read it for me because I've already lost it. Knowing, yeah, knowing that whatsoever good a man, what, doeth, he shall receive what? Of the Lord. So if you do, so are you going to receive of the Lord as a believer for the good that you've done? Are you going to receive of the Lord for the evil that you've done? Does every believer receive the reward of the inheritance? Now you say, how can that be the case? How can that possibly be the case? Folks, you, if you think about it this way, in the positive sense... At the judgment seat of Christ, you will be rewarded with being bestowed what? A reward. In the negative sense, you will be rewarded with suffering the loss of what? Folks, understand that in the end, in the end game, when you boil everything down and, and, and you bring it down to its most basic issue, are you or are you not forgiven of all your sins? Yes. If he's forgiven you of all your sins, can your sin be an issue at the judgment seat of Christ? So the only thing that God can do if he's going to reward you out of his grace is simply not give you a reward. 
That's all he can do. He can't punish you. He can't take something away from you. All he's going to do is just, you're just not going to get what? Is that still a reward? That is still a reward based upon the definition of what the word reward what? Means. On the flip side, if, what, if, if, you're, if your life and service pass to testify at the judgment seat of Christ, will you be rewarded with being bestowed a reward? Folks, does what you do here and now matter in eternity? Now let me say a few things here as my time is running out. Coffee mug, right? Everybody loves coffee. Amen, that's right. <laughs> At the judgment seat of Christ, is every believer going to be overflowing with the spiritual blessings and who they are in Christ? Yes. What the judgment seat of Christ is about is determining your service capacity for the Lord in eternity. Okay? Your responsibility. I closed my Bible, and I shouldn't have. Go back to Colossians 3 in conclusion. I already stopped the timer, but I'm aware of that. Colossians chapter 3. Some might say, well, what I'm going to do is I really want to be a throne. So I'm going I'm to do everything I can in this life to make sure I'm a throne. Can I tell you, if that's your attitude, you're guaranteeing you won't be one? You're gar because the issue is not, I'm going to do this so that I can get that. The issue is, be who, be who you are in Christ, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Do all things, verse 23, heartily unto the Lord and not unto men. Don't worry about what you're going to end up with or what you're going to get because the Lord is going to judge you accordingly and just worry about getting in the Word, letting His Word dwell in you richly, letting it be His life living in you that is producing the work, not you striving after something in the, in the power of your own flesh so you can get something better. Just be who you are in Christ. Let, do all things heartily unto the Lord and let the rest take care of itself. Understanding, though, that that is how we are to live as members of the church, the body of Christ. See, the judgment seat of Christ is not so much about, oh, I'm going to do this so I can have this better thing here and have this position of authority so I can lord over everybody and rule like the Gentiles rule. Okay? No, no. It's about the service capacity that you've built into your inner man here in this life being identified by the Lord Jesus Christ in eternity and there being the appropriate result apportioned to you. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to go have an English muffin. <laughs> Dearly Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to preach and for your word. Grateful for our inheritance and who we've been made in Jesus Christ. Amen.